economic growth in developing Asia continues to be resilient. Following the rise in inflation in 2021 and 2022, inflation has declined in 2023 and into 2024. Growth is being driven by robust domestic demand, improving semiconductor exports, and continued recovery in tourism. ADB forecasts 4.9% growth for developing Asia this year and next year. Stronger growth in South and Southeast Asia will offset lower growth in other subregions. Growth in the People's Republic of China is forecast to slow down to 4.8% this year and 4.5% next year, amid continued property market weakness. India's growth is forecast at 7% this year and 7.2% next year, boosted by strong investment, recovering consumption, and improving exports. Meanwhile, inflation in developing Asia is expected to decline to 3.2% this year and 3.0% next year, as interest rate hiking cycles have peaked. There are several risks to developing Asia's growth outlook, including the current conflicts in the Middle East and geopolitical tensions, uncertainty about U.S. interest rates, intensified weakening of the property sector in the People's Republic of China, and the effects of extreme weather also weigh on the region's outlook. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this Asian Impact webinar for the launch of the April 2024 Asian Development Outlook Report. My name is Abdul Abiyad. I'm Director of Macroeconomic Research here at the Asian Development Bank. I'll be joined by some colleagues later, but let me begin by giving a brief presentation of the findings and key messages of the report. So the title of this year's report is Robust Growth Amid Uncertain External Prospects. Now, let me start by going over the key messages. So last year, growth in developing Asia was strong at 5%, driven by domestic demand. That growth was achieved despite external demand being fragile last year. But the promising sign was that goods exports appeared to bottom out, especially semiconductors. For this year, we're expecting regional growth to remain robust at 4.9% this year, as well as next year. Inflation in the region is projected to continue to moderate from 3.3% last year to 3.2% this year and 3% next year. Downside risks to the outlook include conflicts in the Middle East and other geopolitical tensions, the uncertain path of US monetary policy, turbulence in China's property market, and weather shocks due to climate change and El Nino. Let me now provide more detail on these. So developing Asia's growth momentum continued over the course of 2023, driven by domestic demand. Domestic consumption, which you see here in the dark blue bars, remained strong, lifted by rising consumer demand in the second half of the year. While investment, which is shown in light green, remained resilient with strengthening investment activity in India, Indonesia, and Hong Kong, China, offsetting weakness in the Republic of Korea and Thailand. Starting with the bars on the left, you can see that net exports in light blue contributed negatively to growth for developing Asia as a whole. But there are signs that external demand is turning a corner. In particular, the contribution of net exports to growth in Korea and Taipei, China, and you can see this in the middle part of the, of the slide, turned from negative in the first half of 2023 to positive in the second half as demand for semiconductors started to gain traction. Much of the region's growth has been propelled by solid expansion in India and still solid growth in China in the second half of 2023, and also by the modest recovery in key high-income technology exporters. Expansions in these economies have more than offset the slight moderation in growth in ASEAN economies, which you can see in the right portion of the chart. 
Let me now expand a bit on the industrial and services sectors. After protracted weakness in external demand in the first half of 2023, manufacturing activity gradually improved in the third quarter. The left chart shows the various trends in industrial production. Panel A on the left shows that as the global cycle for semiconductors shifted upward, high-income technology exporters, which account for a large share in the global production of semiconductors, posted gains. In panel B, industrial production remained solid in most ASEAN economies. Meanwhile, in panel C, you can see that India's industrial output grew strongly during 2023, while Pakistan's industrial output stabilized after contracting sharply earlier in the year. The right chart depicts the rebound in global semiconductor billing, so a very important factor for uh, what's been driving developments in the region. Asia-Pacific sales have shown a strong upward trend since mid-2023. For a deeper dive in what's driving the semi semiconductor sector rebound in Asia, we have a special topic in this report on Asia's rebounding semiconductor sector and the role of AI. So I'd invite everybody to read that uh, when you have the time. Turning now to prices, headline inflation continued to ease in 2023. Inflation in developing Asia as a whole, which is panel A on the left, continued its downward trajectory as the lagged impact of monetary policy tightening measures and the easing of some supply side pressures helped to gradually stabilize prices. The easing of global energy and food prices translated into lower inflation for the energy and food components, which you can see in the gray and dark orange bars of the chart. But if we look at the region excluding China, which is panel B in the middle, food inflation remained elevated and contributed 2.7 percentage points to overall inflation in 2023. And that's more than double its pre-pandemic contribution. This is due in part to the effects of adverse, adverse weather on crop production, as well as restricted supply due to food export restrictions in the region, which made it more expensive to import food. Core inflation, the yellow bars at the bottom, also continued to decline, but remains elevated in some economies. In China, which is panel C on the right, 2023 ended in deflationary territory, primarily driven by lower food prices. Despite subdued external demand, exports appear to have bottomed out and are slowly recovering, as you can see in the black line in the left chart. After a brief bump in the first quarter of 2023 following China's reopening, exports declined and bottomed out around the middle of last year, and they've been regaining momentum since then. Exports of high-income tech exporters, which serve as a bellwether for the rest of the region, crossed into positive growth in the fourth quarter of last year, and that's shown by the blue line. In the right-hand side chart, we can see the main sectors behind the slowdown in exports until October. Note that these data are only available for a selection of economies, but they do account for over 90% of developing Asia's exports. Electronics, depicted in blue bars, have dragged down export growth since November of 2022, but the latest figures point to a recovery, which is behind the uptick we're observing for the high-income tech exporters. Another large contributor to negative growth rates last year was oil exports, classified under the mineral sector and depicted in the orange bars. This can be mainly attributed to the decline in oil prices from a high base in 2022, but also to a decline in demand for oil due to the global slowdown. Turning to financial conditions, after, after high global risk aversion in the third quarter of last year, Asia's equity markets have risen since November, supported by less hawkish Fed policy. And you can see this in the left chart. The right chart, which shows net portfolio flows into the Asia region, follows a similar pattern. The region saw a turnaround with net portfolio inflows since November after, in, after experiencing outflows in the previous quarter. This change, again, was, was driven by a less hawkish monetary policy stance by the Fed. In China, however, uncertainty over the outlook contributed to portfolio outflows from November to January. Those are shown by the orange bars although these were significantly less than in the preceding months, as the effects of stimulus measures to support the property sector and the economy began to take hold. In February, China recorded inflows for the first time since July 2023, 
following the government's announcement of further policy measures. Turning now to debt. The left chart shows most economies in the region still face higher debt levels than before the pandemic. The diamonds refer to 2023 and are almost everywhere higher than the gray bars, which are the debt levels for 2019. However, conditions have improved with higher growth and higher inflation, reducing debt to GDP ratios. The blue bars show the change in public debt in 2023 and debt declined by an average of 0.2 percentage points in the region. That's not a lot, but importantly, debt is no longer rising. Having said that, debt remains elevated for some countries, most notably Bhutan, Lao PDR, Sri Lanka, and Maldives, where debt to GDP remains above 100%. The right-hand side chart shows that fiscal deficits narrowed in many economies in the region in 2023. So they, those are the ones for where the yellow bars, sorry, the yellow diamonds are above the blue squares. And obviously this uh, fiscal consolidation can help to mitigate risk. However, vulnerabilities persist for a handful of high-risk economies. So let me just talk about those briefly. In Lao PDR, uh, you have a worsening fiscal position that was really due to currency depreciation, elevated debt levels, and substantial foreign denominated, de denominated debt. And that's heightened sovereign debt risk in that country. In Pakistan and Sri Lanka, you have policies that were supported by IMF programs, which have helped stabilize the situation in those two countries. But challenges remain in sustaining those reforms, given substantial debt servicing costs and sizable external debt. In the major advanced economies, we expect growth to slow and diverge in 2024. Thank you. Uh, weakened by lagged effects of high interest rates and softening trade. So as you can see in the table on the left, G3 growth, so the, the G3 is the aggregate of the US, the Euro area, and Japan. We expect growth there to decline to 1.3% this year from 1.7% last year. Declining in, in both the US and the Euro area is expected to prompt monetary easing as seen in the middle chart, and that will help support growth in 2025. Turning to the chart on the right, oil prices, shown in blue, have been relatively stable recently, and we expect prices to remain in the $80 range over the forecast period. Rice prices, shown in black, will be shaped by negative supply shocks due to climate change and the ongoing El Nino phenomenon, as well as India's rice export ban. Among developing Asian economies, Bangladesh, the Philippines, and Timor-Leste are at most at risk of rice price increases, amplifying headline inflation, given that rice and rice products in these countries account for at least 20% of their respective food price baskets. So turning now to the outlook, we forecast that growth across developing Asia will be resilient at 4.9% this year and next year. The slowdown in China, driven by the property sector and a fading post-pandemic services rebound, is forecast to be offset by sustained growth in South Asia and Southeast Asia, where domestic demand remains strong. China's growth rate is expected to moderate to 4.8% this year and 4.5% next year, with services growing slower amid property sector vulnerabilities. Domestic and external demand for low-carbon technologies will remain strong, including for electric vehicles, batteries, and renewables, and we expect policy support to continue this year. However, real estate investment will continue to slow with sluggish housing demand and high financing constraints. This continues despite government's strengthened efforts to stabilize the property market through access to loans for debt payments, a push for affordable housing, and financing support from banks. Continued accommodative monetary policy and fiscal stimulus will also support growth. South Asia is still the fastest growing subregion with improving domestic demand as prices moderate in most economies. At 6.3% growth in 2024 and 6.6% .6 in 2025, South Asia will continue to outpace other subregions in Asia. In India, growth is forecast to remain strong as rising consumption complements continued investment growth. Pakistan and Sri Lanka are anticipated to recover from the contractions of last year. In Southeast Asia, 
This year's growth of 4.6% will be underpinned by robust domestic demand and continued tourism recovery. In the Caucasus and Central Asia, activity will slow this year following a boost in 2023 from Russian migrants' inflows and re-exports. And lastly, in the Pacific, the reopening of mines in Papua New Guinea will offset the slowing pace of the tourism rebound elsewhere in the Pacific. Regional inflation will further cool in all subregions aside from East Asia. Inflation in de developing Asia is forecast at 3.2% this year and 3% next year, down from 3.3% last year. Tight monetary policy is still in place in most economies, and that'll help subdue inflationary pressures. And this is also supported by moderation in global inflation and stable fuel prices. In contrast, inflation in the PRC is expected to bounce back from last year with food prices normalizing. In this report, we highlight four near-term risks. Conflicts in the Middle East and other geopolitical tensions. So uncertain path of US monetary policy would be the second risk we highlight. Risks to China's property market and El Nino and weather-related events. I'll discuss the first two risks in more detail based on analysis we have in the report. But let me finish commenting on this slide by saying that when one looks at the medium term, there are other risks which policymakers will need to continue addressing. These include climate change, economic fragmentation, and the reconfiguring of global supply chains, challenges to public finances, and demographic change. In the next slide, ongoing conflicts in the Middle East have led to disruptions in shipping routes, raised concerns about potential impacts of rising shipping costs on inflation. The Red Sea crisis has led to a rerouting of commercial vessels to sail around South Africa, which is a longer and costlier route. Consequently, shipping costs have been rising. The left chart depicts the evolution of the Baltic Dry Index. This is a shipping freight cost index for the transport of dry bulk materials across more than 20 oceanic shipping routes. The index tracked well the impact of shipping disruptions during the pandemic, more than tripling in 2021. More recently, between September and December of 2023, this Baltic Dry Index increased by 82%, with the rise being associated with events in the Red Sea, basically the attacks of, by Houthis on uh, ships uh, transiting through the Red Sea. Although the Baltic Dry Index softened in January, it's spiking up again since mid-February, and this raises concerns about potential inflationary pressures. To estimate the potential impact that this increase in shipping costs can have on inflation, we rely on recent estimates from the literature. In the right chart, we show the estimated impacts of uh, continued conflict or uh, continued shipping disruptions, more, more specifically, on inflation in developing Asia. We assume that shipping costs rise as we saw, and then stabilize at the January average. The inflationary impact is persistent, peaking 13 months after the initial shock in October 2023. At that point, it's, it is estimated to add about 0.4 percentage points to inflation, and then subside sub, sub, subsequently in the absence of further shocks. The risk of inflationary pressures is heightened for small island economies, where the estimated impact is twice as high. These economies tend to be located farther from trading partners, making them more vulnerable to fluctuations in freight costs. Next, we simulated the potential impacts of a higher for longer interest rate scenario using the global projection model. This is particularly relevant since yesterday, the March US inflation figure came in at 3.5%, above expectations and higher than the 3.2% uh, inflation recorded in February. Uh, that information we didn't have when we put that when we uh, wrote up the report came out last night. But so this scenario is particularly relevant given uh, those developments. To motivate the scenario, we assume the U.S. and eurozone inflation stays persistently higher than we assumed in the baseline throughout the course of 2024. And in response to this more persistent inflation, both the Fed and the European Central Bank keep policy rates constant throughout the remainder of this year. The assumed policy rate paths are depicted by the orange lines in the left-hand side panel, which also shows the model baseline assumptions in blue. The right panel presents the impacts that the model predicts on inflation and GDP growth across economies, and these are all relative to the model's baseline. 
The main channel of the effects on emerging economies comes through interest rate differentials, which then leads to an initial depreciation in their currencies. Uh, impacts on GDP growth in the US and Eurozone are mainly driven by tighter financial conditions, but they're estimated to be relatively small in magnitude. For emerging economies, there is an initial small positive impact on growth through the positive effect of exchange rate depreciation on exports. Once central banks start to raise interest rates, e economic activity slows down for these economies while exchange rates appreciate and then reverse the initial effects. So if I can see the next slide, please, which recaps the main messages of the report. I will end here. I invite the audience to read the report. There's a lot more detail than I can cover in the 15 minutes that I had. So with that, let me end my presentation and hand over to my colleague, Madhavi Pandit, who will moderate the panel discussion and introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul, for the presentation on the outlook for Asia and the Pacific. Hello, everyone. I am Madhavi Pandit, and I'm a senior economist in the research department at the ADB. I will be moderating today's discussion. For a deep dive into the drivers of economic growth and inflation, key risks weighing on the region's outlook, and insights on policy responses to ongoing challenges, we have a group of expert panelists with us today. It is my pleasure to introduce Rana Hassan, Regional Lead Economist, South Asia, Kenji Takamiya, Principal Economist, Central and West Asia, Maria Karina Tinio, Associate Economics Officer, Pacific Department, James Villaferte, Regional Lead Economist for Southeast Asia, and Yotin Jinjarak, Senior Economist, People's Republic of China Resident Mission. So I will kickstart the discussion with a few questions for our panelists. Um, you, the audience, is invited to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Or if you like one of the questions in the box, please hit the thumbs up button and I will raise them with the panelists. OK, let's get started uh, with Yotin on the PRC. How will the property downturn in the PRC affect local government finances? And are you concerned about debt levels, including for local governments? And let me add if there are any policies that might help on this front. Yotin? Uh, thank you, Madhavi. Um, that's a very good question um, and very important one. Um, so to um, uh, put things in a context, uh, maybe I, I can give you some numbers first. So that at the end of 2023, the, uh, the central government that uh, was estimated uh, to equal a quarter of GDP and uh, local government that the equivalent of a third of uh, GDP. Then the, it is estimated that um, the off-balance sheet liabilities uh, from the local government financing vehicles, uh, the LGFV, these are the entities set up to finance the public infrastructure projects uh, could be as large as uh, half of the GDP. So altogether, uh, the augmented debt of the central and the local governments uh, grew from about four-fifths of uh, GDP uh, in 2018 uh, to more than 100% of GDP uh, in the 2023. So that, that gives us the, the context of the size of uh, uh, the public debts, uh, including both uh, central, local, and the off-balance sheet. So the, the elevated public debt levels uh, imply that um, uh, the scope for additional borrowing is uh, narrowing, right? Um, now, the, since the property, uh, property market uh, uh, downturn started in the 2021, uh, the local governments um, uh, have faced uh, uh, quite a hard budget constraints as um, their own source revenues uh, decline uh, with uh, the sale of uh, land use rights to uh, property developers. Um, at the same time, the uh, local governments uh, already share a significant burden of uh, pandemic-related health um, and medical expenditure during the pandemic lockdowns. So with the local government, the debt is still uh, large and uh, their ability to raise revenue um, uh, rather limited. Um, we expect the central government will likely assume uh, some local government responsibilities. 
Um, in terms of the solutions, um, uh, there are several that appear in the pipeline uh, with the, the debt of uh, local government uh, financing vehicles, the LGFV at the center of this. Um, to mention a few, the first approach is the, the local government using the special uh, refinancing bonds to pay for debts and uh, areas of uh, LGFV and uh, state-owned enterprises to businesses. So that is the first approach. Uh, the second approach is the, yeah, an asset sale. Then we have uh, the third approach um, uh, uh, appearing in the pipeline. This is um, uh, to use the internal money uh, from the strong LGFVs uh, to assist the weaker LGFVs. Then we have the fourth approach, uh, which is the debt swaps. Uh, and this is especially the case for the non-standard debts, uh, such as uh, trust loans, uh, acceptance bills, account receivables, and also the use of refinancing and liquidity injection with the support from policy banks and uh, the People Bank of China, the central bank. And uh, the last but not least approach that I want to mention is the, um, uh, uh, it appears that the government, central government tried to ensure that uh, the local government's project and spending are designed and implemented in such a way that they are effectively uh, meeting uh, the objectives uh, within the uh, respective local government's uh, debt capacities. So these this are um, the, the, um, the solutions to the, the debt situation that uh, we are monitoring uh, in the PRC. Over to you, Madhavi. Thank you, Yotin, for the excellent summary. I'm sure there will be some follow-up questions on the PRC, and we will come back to you. But let me bring in James um, with a question on Southeast Asia. Uh, James, how do you see the prospects for exports in Southeast Asia this year in light of improvement in global electronic cycle, which Abdul presented? And what are some of the risks facing exports in the region? Thank you, Madhavi. We are very bullish about the prospects for export in the region. In the first two months, by looking at the number, in the first two months of the year, export growth in the sub, in the region, sub region has averaged 4.8, in contrast to minus 9% growth last year. And this is really because of the recovery in electronics. So if we look at the electronics uh, code uh, in February, it increased by 19%, whereas Last year, January to October, all the growth of electronic exports from ASEAN to, to the world is uh, double-digit negative. And we expect this trend to continue for the rest of the year, especially as Abdul said, uh, for the, the demand from the technology-enabled economies are quite strong. But that said, there's a, there's a few risks um, confronting export of sub-region. One of them is of course, the more moderate outlook in uh, PRC. We know that Southeast Asia and PRC are quite intertwined and weaker moderate outlook in the PRC would mean that the demand from PRC for ASEAN exports would be weaker. The second one is PRC as well is a major source of FDI for ASEAN and it's quite correlated to export growth. So again, that's, that's um, a negative speed over effect. The second risk to export as well as in terms of the geopolitical tension, where we have seen some uh, trade restructuring. So we've been hearing stories about reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, and all, all these uh, different geopolitical scenarios have neg negative implications on Southeast Asia growth. Um, the good thing, I think, is that uh, a few countries in the region, particularly Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, still remains to be quite attractive to multinational companies basically because of low input and labor cost, and they also have a very large market. I think the last risk to exports that uh, the region policymakers are quite uh, worried about as well is um, the, the increasing, the increasing, the, 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 the changing technology which is affected, affecting the, the global value chain. So I think for the region, we need to ensure that we have we continue to retrain and up, uh, reskill and upskill our workforce 
so that uh, the global value chain of Southeast Asia remains to be a positive proposition to, to the rest of the world. Like, for example, if we talk about cars, uh, the cars that we know today are quite different from uh, the cars before. And uh, a lot of these cars now are more of software systems. And the region needs to be able to train our workforce, also strengthen the R&D and innovation so that we can have access to this new emerging technology. Thank you, Madabi. Thank you, James. Um, let's move across to South Asia and bring in Rana for a discussion first on India. Uh, so the ADO report plugs India as a major growth engine for the region. Uh, the question is how sustainable is the current rate of growth? Thank you, uh, uh, Madhavi. Uh, let me make a few points uh, on this. Um, first, India accounts for more than 80% of uh, the South Asia region's GDP. And simply from that perspective, uh, what happens in, in uh, India is going to be driving the South Asian aggregates. Um, and uh, on this, uh, you know, there's a point I do want to stress, uh, which is that as India integrates itself in a bigger way into uh, global value chains, particularly in the manufacturing sector, uh, you know we know it's already a bigger, uh, it, it's already a big player in services and knowledge intensive areas. You know there's these global cap capability centers. We have been seeing mushrooming up. Uh, uh, you know so the service part is there, but as the manufacturing sector um, grows, and, and, and this is really key, I think it'll give rise to stronger direct linkages between growth drivers in India and our region. So for this, you know, trade policy and trade facilitation become really central. Uh, we know that the South Asia region tends to be amongst, uh, you know, the the the, the subregions of the world, not just Asian Pacific, which tend to be less integrated than the rest of the world, um, and and they also tend to trade much less with one another as compared to other subregions like ASEAN, for example. So uh, as this integration to trade happens, uh, India becomes a growth engine, not just from a you know statistical perspective, uh, but also in terms of directly uh, pulling the region. Now, let me come to the second part, uh, which is you know how sustainable is the current growth rate that that uh, uh, we're talking about, and and frankly, even even going beyond uh, the two years. Um, we 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 are quite positive uh, on on this issue. Uh, so let me respond to this in terms of first the services sector and then the manufacturing sector. Now we know that India's services sector has been doing quite well for a long time. It's been a really big uh, growth engine, and uh, we we see this as continuing. In fact, if you look at even the high frequency recent data. Um, it, it indicates that the financial sector, real estate sector, professional services are all doing well. The, the purchasing managers index for services has been above 60 for the last three months. So it, it, it shows growth momentum. Uh, what's really key for the medium term is what happens in the manufacturing sector. And, and I think uh, here again, um, uh, there, there, there's reason for optimism, cautious optimism, simply because of the things that uh, India has been doing in, in the last several years, actually. And, and, and so we see this effort to streamline businesses, uh, uh, sorry, uh, business processes to enhance uh, the ease of doing business. Uh, we see large uh, um, in investments in infrastructure. I mean, we're seeing that uh, directly as one of the big growth drivers um, of, of GDP. Uh, we are seeing uh, logistics infrastructure in particular improving ports, um, uh, roads, highways. We are seeing um, the railways uh, sector being subject to a number of reforms. Um, we are seeing reforms to India's labor regulations. So uh, for a long time, India's labor regulations have been held as a factor that has really stymied the, the, the formal manufacturing sector. And the government a couple of years ago has uh, you know, collapsed 44 overlapping and, 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 and frankly, um, you know, some elements of the labor code have been quite uh, inflexible from a firm's perspective. And they've taken these, they've streamlined them, they've uh, passed through parliament four codes. And what we're waiting now for is um, the, the rules to be uh, notified at the state level. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's all in the right direction. The other big issue um, that's been a constraint for manufacturing is labor. But here we see the industrial parks uh, or, or what's called economic zones in other countries, um, uh, uh, initiatives uh, taking forward, states 
have been identifying lands, amalgamating them, and, and setting up industrial parks. So we do see a number of these uh, efforts to really improve uh, the investment uh, climate. Um, at the same time, you know, we've, we've seen uh, banking industry reforms, which again affects uh, not only services, but manufacturing. Uh, there's been an introduction of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act, um, various governance reforms of banks with capital infusion. And so overall, it's, it's, it's a story where things are coming together. Let me stop there. Thank you, Rana. Um, while I still have you on the screen, and since you alluded to it, maybe I can ask a follow-up question. Um, so as you said, a lot of the um, estimates and forecasts for South Asia seem to be driven by India, but there are divergent performances across the region. So growth slowed in a few countries in 2023. And also I see a question here in the chat that says, Sri Lanka's economy seems to be bottoming out. So why do we see such divergent performances? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. So um, a number of country-specific factors. In the case of uh, Maldives, you know, let me start with that one. Um, part of the issue really has been a, a timing of uh, 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 tourist um, uh, bookings. So Maldives uh, had already announced uh, back in 2022 that it was introducing a new GST tax. Uh, it came into effect on the 1st of January, 2023. And, and interestingly, what's happened is that even though tourism numbers, tourism arrivals went up uh, 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 quite nicely, um, we, we actually saw um, reduced earnings uh, from these uh, tourist bookings. So this is something that definitely affected the first quarter and then, uh, uh, you know, so, and, and that has affected uh, the total earnings uh, um, from the sector. And it's a very, very important sector for the Maldives. So uh, a, a very uh, country specific factor over there. The good news uh, uh, on, on that front is that in Q4, we've actually been seeing uh, the, the data is showing, you know, good uh, um, climb up off again, the tourist arrivals and, and also the revenues from tourism. And you have to remember that tourism, uh, because it's so important to the economy, there's just all these uh, uh, linkages to, to other uh, uh, sectors. Now, Bangladesh is, is an interesting case. Uh, growth moderated in 2023, um, and, and basically this reflected reduced uh, demand um, uh, uh, from, from, uh, uh, for, for Bangladesh's exports. So exports from Bangladesh still grew, uh, but they decelerated sharply. And uh, this was the count uh, of, of a number of things, including um, power shortages. Uh, so, you know, this is stemming from the time of the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, and, and, and so with gas prices really going up, there, there, there have been these uh, power shortages for the country. Um, there was also this uh, dampening effect of high inflation on, on consumption in Bangladesh. And in fact, you know, if you look at the inflation data, uh, while we see it moderating, and that's something that Abdul also noticed for the region as a whole, Bangladesh is one of those economies where actually there has been a bit of persistence in, in inflation. Um, Nepal is, again, one of those countries where um, uh, we were all surprised by growth coming in much lower than was anticipated. And here, actually, it was the effect of monetary tightening. Um, you know, a number of these economies, they, they were hard hit by COVID um, and, and export earnings uh, declined, tourism uh, uh, revenues declined, remittances had declined. And I'm talking about the 21-22 period. Um, so Nepal, you know, undertook monetary tightening in a big way, and it led to uh, just a, a clampdown on credit, which which affected manufacturing, which affected uh, construction. So, in fact, we saw a contraction in the industrial sector in 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 Nepal. But once again, uh, what we are seeing is really bottoming out of these uh, forces. Uh, finally, let me just uh, uh, mention on Sri Lanka. Absolutely, you know the 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 the, the question that uh, the 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 pan the the question that's been put on the chat box about whether we see it bottoming out. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we are hoping, uh, we are expecting that 2024 we're going to finally see a, a resumption in growth. This is coming after two consecutive years of uh, GDP contraction. And uh, the good news is that, you know, when we look at the data from uh, the, the, the last quarter of 2023, we are seeing all the major sectors actually registering positive growth. So not only agriculture, which actually registered positive growth for the whole year, but also industry and services. Let me stop there, Madhvi. Thank you very much, Rana. 
Um, let's move on to our next panelist, Kenji. And uh, I have a question for you regarding Pakistan, uh, which now has an IMF program in place. And I understand there have been some recent developments. Perhaps you can comment on what are the prospects for Pakistan? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, further to the completion of the review, first review of the nine month standby arrangement in January 2024, the IMF reached the stop rebel agreement on its second and final review recently on 20th of March for the subsequent exact board consideration that may reportedly take place in late April. We understand that authorities already express interest in even the follow-up medium-term program that may potentially and continuously address fiscal consolidation, monetary and exchange rate policy reforms, energy sector reforms, and broader structural reforms. The IMF program is expected to help restore some fiscal and external balances, and the stabilization achieved may contribute to bringing back investor confidence that is necessary for Pakistan's stands sustained economic growth. Accordingly, the ADO projects a gradual rise of the growth rate to 1.9% in this fiscal year and 2.8% in the next fiscal year, from minus 0.2% in the fiscal year 2023. Inflation may still stay at the high level, but is projected to diminish from nearly 30% in the last fiscal year to 25% in the fiscal year 2024 and 15% in the fiscal year 2025. Yet the downside risk remain and both uh, on both an external fronts and careful economic management would be required on the part of the authorities. Let me stop here. Thank you. Kenji, can we also talk a little bit about the um, Caucasus and Central Asian countries and what has been happening recently with regard to the Russian invasion of Ukraine's impact on these countries and how is it affecting the outlook? Yeah, thank you. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine brought about the substantial impacts on growth for the economies of the Caucasus and the Central Asia. The most visible impacts was the sizable monetary inflow associated with, it, with the people who moved from the Russian Federation in 2022. Two out of the eight economies of the subregion, namely Armenia and Georgia, recorded the double-digit growth back then. The volume of remittances to, to the region, the returns is to the region substantially declined by now, except where its source shifted from Russia to elsewhere. Moving forward, with even possibly lesser remittances inflow generally for many countries of the Caucasus and the Central Asia, and stagnant oil production in Kazakhstan, the subregion's largest. The overall growth rate expected to decline from 5.3% in 2023 to 4.3% this year. A recent terrorist attack in Moscow may further curtail remittance inflow to some Central Asian economies substantially, posing a serious downside risk to the growth outlook. We still have to watch out for other geographic sorry, geopolitical risk, also arising from the Middle East very carefully. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, the final subregion, we can um, uh, bring in Kara for a discussion. What impact will increased out-migration of skilled labor have on Pacific economies? And are there policy responses for them? Thank you, Madhavi. Um, so yes, definitely. Uh, out-migration of skilled labor would have an impact on uh, Pacific economic growth. So uh, we have been identifying shortages in, uh, we have observed shortages in um, critical sectors such as tourism, construction, agriculture, and healthcare. Uh, you lose further uh, labor shortages in, in these sectors would definitely affect the prospects for growth in the countries that are dependent on them. And notably, tourism is one that drives growth in quite a few of our Pacific uh, economies. Um, policy responses, I know that the governments across the subregion have been considering a number of them, and we uh, at ADB are working with them on um, most uh, the projects that I've supported at least. They, they've been focused on educating the workforce. So a number of things that you can do is definitely to build a quality workforce that would 
not only help address uh, labor shortages domestically, but also help sustain remittance flows that continue to be very important to the Pacific. Um, so that's educating them, investing in healthcare, improve, uh, encouraging the participation of um, women and youth, and uh, providing pathways for local employment to make it another viable option for workers in the Pacific. Thank you. Kara, let me follow up with a question from the Q&A box on how global supply chain disruption could be a major risk for the Pacific. Thank you, Madavi. I did spot that question. It is a very significant risk in the Pacific. Um, most of our economies are highly import dependent, not only for capital equipment and inputs to production, but also for uh, consumer products and essential goods. So a disruption in the global supply chain would limit the access not only to um, equipment that would help uh, promote economic activity in the subregion and, and therefore contribute to growth, but also consumer goods and essential products such as you know medicines and things like that that would also affect the very well-being of the people who live in the Pacific. So uh, it it would affect the 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 region on uh, the subregion on a on a number of very vital levels and uh, that that's a something that we need to watch very carefully as we're just coming off a high inflation uh, situation from a couple of years back so we need to keep an eye on this situation as well as it as it unfolds thank you Thank you, Kara. Speaking of inflation, let's have a little discussion on the topic. Um, let's start with Abdul because this is a question for the region in general. Um, the question says that overall ADB seems a little overconfident about the trajectory of inflation, especially in advanced economies. And also, you know, freight costs, supply chains. Um, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Let me talk about uh, inflation in the advanced economies first. Um, Absolutely. So our our baseline forecast was actually in line with uh, most uh, other expectations. And yes, so the numbers that came out, uh, well, earlier today for us here in Asia, um, were a bit of a surprise. And I, this is why we revised our forecast. So you know, uh, we had we were initially expecting three rate cuts by the Fed starting in June, that will likely not happen now. Uh, it'll probably be delayed past June. So yes, I mean, it. it's really tricky. These supply, um, uh, these inflationary pressures are, you know, it, uh, it, they're, it, it's hard to tell how persistent they will be. And that's why there's so much uncertainty about uh, where Fed policy will go. On freight costs and supply chains, I mean, this is why, and, and actually for both of those, that's why we highlight, highlight them as the two main risks. Um, and th they really are, I mean, so we, th there's no downplaying them. They, they are important and they can uh, have significant inflationary impacts and, and even uh, uh, possibly some growth impacts. Uh, it's important to remember that for Asia as a whole, a lot of what's driving growth is domestic demand. And that, uh, so, you know, are our, our, our the forecast are the growth forecasts in particular overly optimistic given these risks? I would think not. A lot of it really depends on how domestic consumers and investors are feel about their economies. And so far, a lot of what we're seeing is that uh, that 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 has that the strength that we've seen over the past period will continue uh, over the forecast horizon as well. Thanks. Thank you, Abdul. To continue with this discussion, there is a question that says, while inflation is generally on the downward trajectory in in Asia and the Pacific, the, there are some countries where it seems to be fa fairly persistent. So let me first uh, invite Rana to comment on the example given here is Bangladesh, followed by Kenji for the CCA region as well. Right. So, Madhavi, this is uh, regarding, uh, you know, the issue of um, uh, uh, LDC graduation, right? Um, no, uh, sorry, on the inflation in Bangladesh being persistent. Oh, 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 oh excuse me. Uh, yes. So, uh, the, 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 the reason for uh, um, uh, this is, uh, it, it's, it's a number of factors. Uh, first of all, uh, the depreciation of the Taka. Uh, we, we've seen a, a relatively large uh, depreciation. Um, and 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 this has led to 
uh, just uh, higher uh, import costs. Uh, that that's that's uh, one one channel. The second thing was these uh, uh, supply uh, uh, shortages, uh, in particular the energy shortages. And and we've seen that you know any time you have these uh, 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 cuts to power, etc., uh, supply side you know gets restricted. Uh, you you've you've got uh, a, you know stable demand out there, and and you're going to see uh, costs go up. So uh, these these are the fundamental uh, you know uh, three issues that uh, we would put out there. Uh, I should also say that you know one of the things that uh, Bangladesh has been doing, and and uh, uh, this is quite important to keep in mind. Uh, it's it's actually under uh, it's it's uh, uh, it, it's it's got a couple of IMF programs. Uh, um, uh, underway, they, these uh, you know kicked in, in in January of 2023, and uh, they cover a number of things, including you know climate financing issues. But quite important from an inflation point of view is some adjustments to the conduct of monetary policy and exchange rate policy. So Bangladesh is is moving towards more of a um, market determined exchange rate. Right, you know we we have seen these these rather large uh, uh, gaps. Uh, in the the market exchange rate and the curb rate and 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 you know with the uh, change with with the changes coming up to the exchange rate framework these are going to uh, uh, come together uh, on on the conduct of monetary policy also so uh, you know while in 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 in, in you know we, we tend to think of uh, um, the standard relationship between uh, you know the central bank tightens monetary policy and it has this uh, you know nice uh, transmission and 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 brings down prices. We haven't seen as a strong a transmission mechanism in the case of uh, of of Bangladesh. So while they were tightening monetary policy, there were some other factors in the conduct of monetary policy which which uh, make that transmission mechanism a little less effective. Now that's also an issue that uh, uh, the the authorities have been taking into account under the IMF program. Program. So that's that's uh, 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 a reason to be optimistic because uh, you know when you just look at uh, the latest review, for example, the third review of the IMF program, you do see um, uh, progress on on these fronts. Thank you, Rana. Kenji, could you comment as well for your subregion? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, inflation. Um, yeah, let me just uh, sort of provide the historical background. Um, the countries in in the Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, started sort of adjustment of the monetary policy, perhaps larger than the rest of Asia. Um, when the sort of economic boom after the post-COVID uh, came early uh, a few years ago, some of the countries already started to raise interest rates. Uh, and, or some other countries are making relatively high interest rate that might have sort of deflation, not deflation, post, post, but anti-inflationary sort of um, impact. Uh, and uh, more recently, um, um, some of the country are already started to loosening the monetary policy. And, did it, and this cycle really depends on which country we are talking about. But because of the sort of earlier introduction of, of, of tighter monetary policy, the region as a whole is, is expected to see sort of downturn trend of inflation. That's why uh, for ADO, for the region, Caucasus and Central Asia as a whole, uh, inflation uh, uh, projection has been sort of projected, uh, sorry, forecast to 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 go down from from 10.5% in 2023 to 7.9%. Uh, for for this year and the seven percent for the next, but some countries started uh, uh, monetary relaxation earlier than the others, and for these countries, uh, inflation uh, uh, is is gradually stepping, uh, sort of popping up. Uh, for example, for Armenia, inflation for this year, I'm sorry, for last year was two percent, and then and the projection for the for this year is three percent. Uh, for Georgia, the last year's inflation was 2.5, and this year 3.5%. Uh, it's just ha so happened that those countries are are sort of smaller. So so in the average uh, sort of weighted averaging, uh, the the these would not be a, a, a sort of reflected in the in, in in the regional um figures, but but the effect of the monetary policy is is really ha beginning to happen, especially those. That are sort of loosening the, the monetary policy. Uh, okay, that's all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kenji. Thank you. 
Um, there are a um, couple of questions in the context of Southeast Asia. James, if you could address them briefly. Uh, one is uh, with regard to the challenges to economic growth and job creation due to new patterns in globalization amid intense demographic and technological uh, changes. So um, do you have any comments on how these might affect the performance of these countries, especially with regard to export-led growth? Okay. Thanks. Uh, just before I answer that, Madhavi, uh, just want to add on the discussion on inflation. For Southeast Asia, we are also seeing quite moderate inflation. And aside from the other factors mentioned, there are other policies in the region that were actually helping reduce inflation. In particular, these are actually price controls. We have been seeing it sometimes. There's also fuel and uh, fuel subsidies, reduction in electricity tariff. And there's also some reduction in tax rate. So that's also contributing to low uh, inflation in Southeast Asia. At the same time, for some of the smaller economies in Southeast Asia, like uh, Timor Leste, Myanmar, or Lao PDR, we are seeing a very high food inflation. And one factor that's driving this is actually, especially for those economies who rely on imported food, is the sharp depreciation in their local currency. Now to discuss uh, uh, the, the, the question about the job prospects and implications of technological advancement on the region. So I, I guess this is, they're partly asking the question of uh, new technology on employment. Is that the, is that the context of the question? Uh, yes, I guess changing uh, trends and how. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one, one concern among policymakers and also a lot of uh, people in, in the region is that the introduction of AI, chat GPT, and other new emerging technology could actually reduce uh, employment and growth prospects for the region. Uh, there has been several studies, I think, in this area, particularly during the introduction of digital marketplaces, where we were quite scared in terms of the implications in, on jobs. I think the first, the first point that I would say is that this advanced technology, like, for example, uh, AI or chat GPT, if workers work with them, they actually make them more productive and more efficient. Therefore, this can actually increase income and provide for other jobs. So it can have both a job creating a portion as well as a for the low for the low skilled work, which can be automated probably. Or for example, in the BPO sector, there are uh, applications of AI for 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 low low value added BPO. There could be jobs that could be at risk, but our experience is that this this new technology tend to create new jobs as well. So I think I think the net benefit the net benefit of this technology can be in terms of one improving efficiency, two creating new jobs, particularly for uh, the high skilled workers. But probably one implication of this new technology new tech introduction of new technologies, this could actually introduce inequality within the workforce. Those that are more skilled who can use this new technology platform can actually earn more and have more uh, work opportunities, where, or, whereas the low-income, mid middle-skilled workers can, can have some risk. So I think this is where policies about reskilling, retooling, and increasing the digital literacy of the workforce is quite important. Thank, Thank you, you James. We may have time for one last question. So let me address it back to you, Tin. What more can be done by the PRC to address weak consumer sentiment and boost domestic demand? Thanks, Madhavi. Uh, so I'll keep it brief. Um, so to boost the demand and um, lift up the sentiment, uh, I think um, if the government can um, uh, facilitate the household to feel um, confident in the, their wealth and um, their income. Uh, wealth, because of, uh, um, if you look at the wealth of the Chinese household, uh, uh, more than the, the 70% is in the, the form of the, the housing investment. So that's why now the Chinese government is trying to uh, fix the property market and healthy the, have the healthy exit of um, uh, uh, the property developer in light of uh, lower demand for um, uh, housing in, in China. Um, then on the income, the, um, uh, the Chinese government is also the, um, uh, 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 trying to the, promote the, the new quality productive forces. Uh, this is the, to um, use the industrial policy to create jobs in manufacturing in the new and uh, 
emerging strategic sector. And I think this is a good thing because um, uh, if you build up manufacturing sectors, um, it would help spill into creating jobs, uh, high paid and high quality job in the services sector, which in turn uh, increase the income of Chinese household. And I think that that's how uh, uh, China is going in terms of uh, lifting up sentiment and uh, boosting the consumption demand. Thank you, Yotin. So that brings us to the end of an interesting and stimulating discussion today. A big thank you to Abdul and all the panelists uh, for the discussion. The Asian Development Outlook is available online, so please download and read all the extensive and interesting analyses. Thank you all for attending the webinar launch. If you like this event, the next Asian Impact webinar um, is an Asian Development Policy Lecture by uh, Vic Adamovics on 25th April 2024, 2 to 3.30 p.m. Manila time via Zoom. Thank you. Have a good day.